Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Will Tanner, and I am the director of Onward, a think tank whose mission it is to renew the centre-right for the next generation by developing bold and practical policies that meet the challenges of today and by reaching out to new groups of people. And there are a few issues within our political economy in greater need of renewal than the subject of today's event, the union. The union between England and Scotland is widely perceived to be one of the most successful political unions in modern history. It has stood for more than 300 years, endured the separation of Ireland, two world wars, uh, the end of empire, an entry into and now exit from the European Union. It is not only a constitutional device that unites two nations under a sovereign parliament, it is, in the words of one scholar, a personality that enriches our culture, strengthens our economy, and improves our democracy. And yet, as we meet today, uh, the union appears fragile as a result of growing support for independence. Um, and as, as we have seen in lengthy evidence sessions over the last few weeks, growing questions about the operations of the Scottish government and the ability of the Scottish parliament to hold that government to account. Having spent the last few years debating one highly polarised and knotty constitutional question, it feels like we may spend the next few years grappling with another. So I am delighted this morning to welcome Douglas Ross, the leader of the Scottish Conservatives to Onward, to give a major speech addressing these and other issues. Douglas will be known to many in Westminster as, a mem as the Member of Parliament for Moray, a seat he took in the 2017 general election, and a former Minister for Scotland. And before entering Parliament, he was an MSP for the Highlands and Islands region, having served as a councillor on Moray Council for nearly a decade before that. And he was elected unopposed in July uh, to be the new leader of the Scottish Conservatives. And he is running in the May elections to regain a seat in his former Highlands and Islands region. In a moment, I'm going to hand over to Douglas uh, for his remarks. But before I do that, I just want to set out three very quick pieces of housekeeping. So firstly, um, you may be tuning in from your living rooms or your bedrooms, but we would love for you to contribute questions and comments in the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your Zoom portal. Uh, you can do so just clicking the Q&A button and inserting a, a comment or a question. And I would urge you, as with all Onward events, to keep those questions civil and constructive, and we will be screening out anything that doesn't meet those requirements. Um, secondly, if you're having any te technical difficulties at all, please contact uh, rsvp at ukonward.com and one of my team will endeavour to assist you and to get you back online. And thirdly, my job as chair, as well as asking some of the questions to Douglas after he's given his speech, um, will be to close the event promptly at 11.30 to protect his diary and everyone else, everyone else is tuning in. Um, so if you do want to ask questions, please ask them well before then. So without further ado, I'm delighted uh, to welcome Douglas Ross. Douglas, over to you. Thank you very much, Will, and thank you for the opportunity through Onward to deliver this speech today uh, and to take your questions later on. On the 1st of July 1999, at the first state opening of the Scottish Parliament, Donald Dewar said, this is about more than our politics and laws. This is about who we are, how we carry ourselves. And that quote for me embodies the tone that was set for the Scottish Parliament from that day forward. The belief that it would not just deliver on the devolution promises made by the Constitutional Convention, but also that it would carry itself in a different manner from the Westminster Parliament. That Scottish politics would be more consensual, open and transparent, and closer to the people it served than the perceived adversarial, closed and distant politics of London. Now, with many of the first MSPs continuing as MPs, retaining all political loyalties, you could be forgiven for thinking that that dream was hopelessly naive. But those were the ideals that underpinned the establishment of the Scottish Parliament more than two decades ago. And they are the principles that have endured in the perceptions of the Scottish people towards the Scottish Parliament. It's part of the reason why it has gained such widespread support across our nation in a relatively short period of time. But those perceptions have also stifled legitimate debate around the issues that are present in the Scottish Parliament. At its worst, they have come from two, at times, arrogant assumptions. Firstly, that 
Scottish politics will always be superior to Westminster and therefore has nothing to learn from it. As Professor James Mitchell of the University of Edinburgh wrote recently, Holyrood defines itself against a caricature of the Westminster model, not informed by the actual operation of the UK Parliament and the significant advances that have been made in recent years, but instead by a perception of Westminster politics, a perception informed by PMQs more than anything else. Secondly, that any of its feelings are not as a result of the processes, but instead because it's incomplete. And so the nationalist goal of separation must be achieved before any consideration can be made on to how to approve the operation of the Scottish Parliament. There has been a continual focus on debating what powers the Scottish Parliament ought to have, rather than how they better deploy and scrutinise the use of existing powers. As a result, the Scottish Parliament has become frozen in time, increasingly dated in its 1999 model of operating, despite an expanding remit, seemingly oblivious to parliamentary innovations elsewhere, and as such, wholly inadequate to respond to the scandal that has engulfed Scottish politics. What would Donald Dewar say if he could see the current sorry state of the Scot Scottish Parliament he first led? The Sturgeon Salmon scandal has driven the very heart of Scottish politics, and undermine the confidence in the ability of Parliament to hold government to account. The First Minister stands accused from different angles, of breaching the ministerial code, of lying to the Scottish Parliament, of ignoring her own legal advice at a cost of over half a million pounds of taxpayers' money, and of presiding over the introduction of a sexual harassment complaints procedure, which lit down the two women who attempted to have their complaints heard through it. Those are serious charges against any politician, let alone the leader of the governing party, and do real reputational harm to the government that she leads during a global pandemic. When public trust in government and compliance with the decisions that they make is the most valuable tool in our fight against coronavirus, any minister, any politician, any person who's accused on those counts would do anything, anything, to clear their name if they believed their innocence. Yet the SNP government have obstructed and evaded scrutiny in every possible way. The committee inquiry into the handling of the harassment complaints has had to drag each shred of evidence from the government. To the extent that the SNP chair said at one stage that the inquiry was completely frustrated with the lack of evidence and quite frankly obstruction it is experiencing. And there was a real danger it could have been unable to proceed. Even a police search warrant couldn't secure the Scottish Government's compliance. And two votes of the Scottish Parliament for the publication of the legal advice on the decision to fight Salmon's judicial review were flatly ignored. It took putting the Deputy First Minister's job on the line with the threat of a no-confidence vote for some, but again, not all of the evidence to be released four months after it was first requested. And that is still being released on a piecemeal basis with what we've seen predictably showing that the concerns of government lawyers were ignored, yet there's still no guarantee we will ever see the entirety of that evidence with just three weeks to go until purda ahead of the Scottish Parliament elections. As such, we have no choice but to continue with our plans for a confidence vote in the Deputy First Minister this week. Then we have the Lord Advocate the SNP government's chief legal advisor, who also acts as the head of the government's prosecution service, intervening to retrospectively redact documents that had already been published by the Scottish Parliament. In not just a display of damning incompetence, but also total disrespect for parliamentary scrutiny. Finally, there's the independent inquiry into whether Nicola Sturgeon has breached the ministerial code with her actions. An inquiry which the SNP government has written, written the remit for and set the terms. I don't know what the inquiry will conclude, but it's as clear as day to any objective person that she misled Parliament, she failed to follow legal advice, and both of these are breaches of the code. Scottish Parliament votes and committees are being disregarded and ignored by an SNP Scottish government that is able to set the terms of scrutiny at every turn. In what world is a process such as that ever going to uncover the truth of what happened? 
And so my party has decided to also put down a vote of no confidence in the First Minister. The SNP, Sturgeon included, called for the resignation of Labour First Minister Henry McLeish for subletting his office, Conservative leader David McCletchie for expensing party business, and Labour leader Wendy Alexander for failing to declare party donations in her register of interests. Each of these transgressions are of a completely different order of magnitude to what Nicola Sturgeon has done, yet all of them lost their jobs. Indeed, John Swinney previously said that the conduct of the First Minister of Scotland must be beyond reproach. Yet the SNP don't seem to believe that they should be held accountable to that standard. They showed disdain for the very suggestion of a confidence motion, even going so far as to shamelessly hide behind the coronavirus pandemic. The Scottish Conservatives believe that this vote needs to take place to give Parliament the opportunity to have its say on the First Minister's conduct. And the other parties need to show that they have the stomach to stand up to the SNP in the same way that we do, to hold the, government, the, the First Minister to the same standards that she has held others to. This vote is the only tool opposition parliamentarians have at their disposal to put the spotlight on the First Minister's conduct. The SNP has prevented Parliament from proper scrutiny and deployed every tactic to frustrate the committee and whitewash the independent inquiry. The only option we have is a confidence motion to give this the attention it deserves. So that two months from the Scottish Parliament election, the public have the chance to make up their own minds about Nicola Sturgeon's conduct and whether she is fit for the office she holds. By bringing forward these votes of no confidence, I'm also asking the opposition parties to unite with us and to stand up for the Scottish Parliament and its fundamental principles. To demand that votes in the chamber are respected every single time, not only when the government feels like it. To state together that it's for a parliamentary inquiry to decide what information it gets, not the government. To send a clear message that in the Scottish Parliament, we will not tolerate a government trampling over truth, suppressing evidence and shutting down scrutiny. The testimony of multiple credible witnesses and even Nicola Sturgeon's own evidence makes it clear that she misled Parliament. The words of one of Scotland's most senior lawyers, Ronnie, Ronnie Dunlop QC, makes it plain that the government discounted his advice and as a result of that decision, they lost hundreds of thousands of pounds of taxpayers' money. We can all plainly see the evidence against the Deputy First Minister as well. He ignored two votes of Parliament until his job was on the line. He suppressed information to help Nicholas Surgeon. He still withholds information. His statements have lurched from insincere to inaccurate. So as the main opposition to the SNP, I have to ask other parties, do you really think these actions are acceptable? Why should we put up with any of that? Why would we let this government or any government away with this? And I say to them, I'm not afraid of Nicola Sturgeon's poll numbers, and no opposition leader should be either. We will bring forward these votes with no confidence because it's the right thing to do. The evidence of what they have done wrong is overwhelming. It's the job of Scotland's opposition to call that out, not to run and hide from the SNP. When they have used their power, cover up the truth, trample on Parliament, don't let them get away with it. Join with us and stand up to them. Let's confront them together. Let's send a message that we are Scotland's opposition and what they have done, what they are doing to the Scottish Parliament will not be tolerated. Yet it should never come to this. This sorry episode has undermined trust in the First Minister and in her government, but it's also shaken confidence in the Scottish Parliament. Parliament has been tested to its limit in its ability to hold government account, and it's been found wanting. That's not the fault of parliamentarians, but of a structure which has given the SNP all the cards it needs to frustrate the opposition. By deliberately breaking the accountability of government to Parliament, the SNP are damaging our devolved institutions, institutions that give them the authority to govern Scotland's public services. That should concern all of Scotland's parties. Proper scrutiny of government is the backbone of any democracy, and it's essential whatever our constitutional future. Indeed, the former First Minister in his evidence session to the committee inquiry stated that the move to independence must be accompanied by institutions whose leadership is strong, robust 
and capable of protecting each and every citizen from arbitrary authority. It's time to shatter the comfortable illusion that Scottish democracy is superior and accept it can and should be improved. That we look to practice elsewhere, and that includes even at Westminster, for inspiration. That we reassess, after more than 20 years, the effectiveness of the Scottish Parliament and empower it with the tools it needs to properly scrutinise government. This should be a cross-party commission. I don't pretend that the Scottish Conservatives have the answer to every point we are making here. However, I'll start by making some suggestions. Firstly, I believe the scandal has shown where the Scottish Government is accountable only to itself. It's left to the First Minister to uphold the ministerial code and take decisions on the scrutiny of ministerial behaviour. So to make this process independent, we would propose that responsibility for the scrutiny of ministerial behaviour be given to the Standards Committee, just as they report on the behaviour of opposition and backbench MSPs. There should be no separate process for government ministers. Likewise, the conflict in the dual role of the Lord Advocate being both public prosecutor and the government's chief legal advisor has been raised again in this scandal. This has been an issue of concern for my party since the opening of the Scottish Parliament, with David McLeish in 1999 noting the importance of preserving the independence of the two offices. And more than two days, decades later, we will again make the case for the rules to be separated to remove concerns of political interference in prosecution decisions. Then there's a lack of protection for MSPs to speak freely in Parliament and avoid committing contempt for court. Holyrood does not have the full parliamentary privilege, constraining what members can say and the issues they can raise for debate. So to give parliamentary debate proper protection, we will put forward measures to strengthen the legal protections afforded to MSPs when in Parliament. We also need to look at the role of Scottish Parliament committees, which far from offering cross-party apolitical scrutiny as intended, have been driven by the same agenda that exists in the wider chamber. The introduction of elected select committees at cha chairs at Westminster a decade ago has encouraged greater independence for the committee system to challenge the government. And I believe, having served in both parliaments and looking to do so again, that Holyrood would also benefit from a similar move. Finally, and not explicitly tied to the relationship between government and parliament, but important for ensuring continued belief in our democracy, voters to recall representatives who break the law or grossly undermine trust. This is another change made years ago at Westminster and contemplated at Holyrood, but never taken forward. Just this year, we've seen the scandal of a disgraced former minister remaining as an MSP, earning more than £100,000 and failing to represent his constituents. So we will bring forward proposals to allow voters to recall MSPs in exceptional circumstances. Now, these are just a few examples of what we could do, but it's important that we start a discussion with all parties on how we strengthen the ability of the Scottish Parliament to hold the Scottish Government to account, ensuring that we never again have to endure the scandal of our democracy being obstructed like we've seen in the last six months, and that Scottish politics in 2021 can carry itself to that higher standard envisaged in 1999. However, the roots of this crisis run deeper than the Scottish Parliament's relationship with the Scottish Government, and even deeper than Nicol Sturgeon's relationship with Alex Salmond. They are the result of a contradiction. A Nationalist Party intent on securing independence, running a devolved government which is part of the United Kingdom. Unlike my party, which aspires as its highest ambition to one day be the government of Scotland, to have the honour to serve our country and deliver on our manifesto promises and aspirations for the Scottish people, the SNP do not see running of a devolved administration within the UK as an end in itself, but as a means to further their political campaign for separation. They originally opposed the formation of a devolved Scottish Parliament because they believed it would hinder their campaign for independence. The gradualist argument that eventually persuaded the party to shift its position was that the Parliament could actually help to secure independence. And that is why Sturgeon will not be forced out by any internal pressure, regardless of the damage she is doing to her government 
and to our parliament. Because she is too important to the overall nationalist project, their overriding and only real priority. The SNP are willing to overlook any concerns, any feelings, to further their goal towards securing independence. Any issue can be seen as mere collateral, whatever it does to the reputation of the Scottish Parliament, or to the falling standards in our schools, or even record drug deaths. So long as the current leadership is seen as the best chance of achieving independence, their record in government can be ignored by the SNP at large. This scandal is just the latest example of how the SNP's ever willingness to put their political project ahead of the governments of Scotland has damaged our country. After 14 years of failure from the SNP, we can see the deep scars left by that approach across every part of Scotland. And now they've been revealed in our parliament as well. Nationalist government has thrown Scotland into a permanent political crisis. On every front, they've adopted a timid and disinterested attitude towards government. Unwilling to innovate, to revolutionise, to reform in any direction or to take bold or tough choices. It's not just our parliament that's been left behind without leadership, but our NHS, our education system, our economy. The SNP look to accumulate even more powers, but do little with them. Their real goal being control for its own sake, not the improvement of our public services through running devolved government. If we allow the SNP to have five more years of unchecked government, then it doesn't just mean that our parliament will continue to stagnate, but Scotland will too. It will be a parliament working not in the national interest towards our coronavirus recovery, but their own nationalist interest towards another divisive independent referendum. So in less than two months' time, we need to stop that from happening to stop an SNP majority. Yes, it's essential that we strengthen the powers of our parliament to hold government properly to account, but the SNP will ride roughshod over a Scottish parliament, even worse than they're doing so now, if they're left in absolute control of it. The parliament was not designed with majority government in mind, yet in 2011, the SNP broke that system to do just that. And it led to years of division and uncertainty with an independence referendum and all the bile and anger that preceded and followed that vote. If we want to fully utilise the powers of the Scottish Parliament, we cannot allow that to happen again. The Sturgeon Salmon scandal has undermined the Scottish Parliament and dismantled the facade of superiority it maintained. <clears throat> Our parliamentary processes have been exposed to be stagnant and feeble, unable to provide a check on the SNP government that will do anything to protect the First Minister and prevent proper scrutiny. And it's clear that if they're given free reign again, the SNP will continue to undermine the parliament by putting their obsession with separation before the national interest and before our recovery from coronavirus. We can transform the Scottish parliament so that rather than being used as a tool by the nationalists for separation, it can be a bulwark against the SNP in their plans for a second divisive referendum. We can achieve that by enhancing its powers, but we also need to deprive the SNP of political control. So there is a block on their obsession. In the 2016 election, it was the Scottish Conservatives that were able to stop the SNP getting a majority. And in just two months time, we can do that again and take the threat of another referendum off the table so that we can use the Scottish Parliament for what it was intended for, improving public services and driving economic growth. So we can spend the next five years focused on rebuilding Scotland, not just from the devastating impact of coronavirus, but from the last 14 years of SNP government. We need to heal and recover, not just from the pandemic, but from years of division and stagnation. We need to pull together now and work with, not against, the UK government. If we strengthen the Scottish Parliament with more power, but more importantly, a political bloc in the SNP's referendum plans, we can deliver that and build a stronger, more effective Scottish Parliament working in our national interest. Thank you very much.
Douglas, thank you very much for that and um, uh, and a kind of extraordinary uh, kind of breadth of breadth of focus, focusing both on the SNP and their role in their role in government, but also uh, proposing a number of reforms to make the Scottish Parliament work better and to improve some of the constitutional balance within within Scotland. Um, we have had a few questions come through on the Q and A. I would urge people to um, continue asking <coughs> questions. But I'd like to start with a question of my own and abuse, abuse the position of chair, which is um, related not necessarily to the SNP, which was the focus of your speech, but actually to the Labour Party. We've had a new leader of the Labour Party uh, elected recently, Anna Sawa. Um, he writes in The Times this morning, um, accusing the government of indulging in what he calls playground tactics. Um, and and his, in his words, he says that politicians have a duty to focus on what unites us rather than what divides us. Um, and so I wondered, I mean, that is clearly a direct response to uh, to some of the things that the Conservative Party in Scotland is saying, um, to the vote of no confidence that you're putting down in, in, in Nicholas Durgeon. What, what's your response to that? Um, what do you say to someone who says that um, that you're just indulg indulging in playground tactics, which ultimately are not, are not what you're uh, due to be elected uh, for uh, in May? Well, this is not about playground, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> This is not about playground politics. This is about our democracy in Scotland and respect for Parliament, respect for the votes that the Scottish Parliament has already held that have been ignored by the SNP. And it's the job of the opposition to hold the government to account. And if Anna Sawa and the Scottish Labour Party are not willing to do that or to assist the Scottish Conservatives to do that, then I think that is more an indictment on them than it is on the Scottish Conservatives. But we, we've looked at the evidence, even the partial evidence that have has been released is clear. Nicola Sturgeon lied to Parliament, she misled the people of Scotland, and she has spent hundreds of thousands of pounds of taxpayers' money on a case that we know their own lawyers were advising against. That constitutes multiple breaches of the ministerial code. And as I've said in the speech, we've lost first ministers in Scotland before for far less than that. So while you introduced that question by saying Labour weren't the focus of my speech, in some ways they were. I'm calling for Labour, the Liberal Democrats and the Green parties to unite with the Scottish Conservatives again, to vote with us on the vote of no confidence against John Swinney, because he continues to fail to give that vital evidence to the committee and disrespect Parliament, and unite with us to vote against the First Minister, to show that the Parliament cannot have confidence in a First Minister that has misled them and misused public money. Thank you very much. So I'm going to come to our first question from the audience, which is from um, Joanna Mowat. Um, uh, uh, quite a few of the questions are about the union more broadly. And so I'd like to at least start the first few questions on, on the subject of your speech, but I suspect we'll come on to the union in due course. But jo Joanna asks, uh, well, she says, governance is a three-legged stool, parliament, polity, and the press. How do we ensure that the polity and the press can support parliament in delivering the open and transparent government promised at devolution? So I suppose going slightly wider than the um, the context of your speech and actually kind of talking about the, the rest of the, the kind of political economy in Scotland, how, how can you encourage greater accountability through the media or, or indeed through the kind of wider civic society? Well, of course, there will be greater accountability through the media if we look at the powers that the Parliament could have under the proposals I've outlined today in terms of privilege for MSPs. It's parliamentary privilege that has allowed a number of issues to be uh, developed at Westminster and a light to be shone on them. And I think a similar um, response at Holyrood and broadening the powers of privilege that MSPs have been in the chamber or, or in committee, it would then assist the press to hold the government to account, to hold parliament to account. Uh, but we also um, have to look at how the, the press are, are currently reporting on this issue, but the wider aspects within the Scottish Government and there are growing concerns as we are just three weeks away from a vital election here in Scotland that the Scottish Government continue to use what are supposed to be public health briefings to actually promote party political points of view and I think that's something that the BBC are going to have to address very urgently because as we get closer and closer to the perda date we still don't know what's going to happen with the daily televised briefings that the First Minister and the Scottish Government have. And can I ask what's, what your position is on that? Are you are you looking for the for the government to continue briefings, but in a different format, or are you looking for um, for a different type of briefing on coronavirus through the election period? Well, I think it's important, and I've said throughout, there have been opportunities for the first minister and members of her government to make 
major statements as they have done through the BBC actually in Parliament. And I think we should have gone down that route far earlier. But as Parliament rises later on this month, I believe that where there is a public health message to get out, where we need the public to continue to work with government and indeed with everyone across the country to suppress this virus, there is a role for the medical experts to lead these briefings to provide that information. It doesn't need a politician uh, to state what is being done or, or the measures being taken. Uh, that message can effectively be relayed by a medical expert, which takes away the risk of moving that briefing into a political uh, debate, which we've seen has happened more and more often in recent weeks. Um, thank you. So I'm going to now come to a question from Graham McMillan, who's um, asked a kind of explicitly political question, but I think it does go to the heart of, um, of many of the questions uh, that you're raising, and particularly the point that you made about the uh, this kind of Scottish Parliament never really being set up for um, for majority government. It was a, it was a kind of uh, deliberately a, a more consensual Parliament, and he is asking, would you in ever uh, ever in future join with Scottish Labour in some kind of grand coalition in order to uh, preserve the union and potentially prevent the SNP from, from gaining power? Yes, a very simple answer, yes. Because I believe that the last 14 years of failure that we've seen from the SNP has undermined everything we're trying to do in Scotland. We've seen our public services take a back seat to the SNP's obsession with separating Scotland from the rest of the United Kingdom. So surely if the parliamentary masks allow after the next election for the parties who support Scotland's place in the United Kingdom continuing in that strong union uh, being maintained, surely we can work together, put aside some political differences to work in the national interest to focus Scotland uh, on our recovery from coronavirus over the next five years rather than more fights over the constitution. And we can only do that by stopping an SNP majority. But if we can also work together as political parties, I would be quite happy to do that. Indeed, I made that offer to Richard Leonard, the former Scottish Labour leader, and he dismissed it. I then made that offer to the two candidates who were seeking uh, the leadership of the Scottish Labour Party, Anna Sawar and Monica Lennon, uh, and they turned that down within 30 minutes. But I hope they'll reconsider, because this parliament that we elect uh, in May has a huge job ahead of it in terms of rebuilding our economy post-COVID-19. And I think the efforts of every party and every politician should be focused on that not on a constitutional battle uh, that rages within the SNP and where they see Scotland's priority being. So I think parties um, who support Scotland's place in the United Kingdom remaining a strong, integral place should look to work together and I continue to make that offer to Scottish Labour. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to ask one more question of my own, um, just on, on the, the subject of your speech and the kind of uh, operation of uh, of the Scottish um, government, and then we might move on um, to some wider questions about the union, if that's all right, because they are coming in thick and fast on the on the Q&A. Um, and, and and my question um, is is really reg in regard to not not the, the operation of the Scottish government in isolation, but the relationship between the Scottish Parliament and the UK Parliament, because there are some people who would say that while you may well be right that the Scottish Parliament. Uh, is overdue reform and uh, there are significant things that we could do to improve accountability transparency um, within that parliament. Lots of the problems within our wider union stem from uh, the relationship between the two parliaments and I was very struck recently reading the um, the Scottish Government's Scotland Right to Choose document, um, in which the Scottish Government explicitly says that parliamentary sovereignty is no longer an accurate description of the Constitution in Scotland or the UK, which kind of is not legally the case. That is, a, that kind of goes against the Scotland Act and, and certainly commitments made by previous First Ministers and, and previous Scottish Governments. Um, but, but philosophically and politically as a quite a... Um, powerful thing I, I suspect for the SNP to say to their own supporters effectively saying that we can ride roughshod over some of the constitutional norms that have been the case for many years. How do, how do you as a unionist and as the leader of the Scottish Conservatives respond to those kind of assertions which might not have any basis in law but have enormous emotional resonance for some Scots perhaps? Well, I would pick up on, on something you said. These remarks from the SNP are speaking to their supporters. They're not speaking to Scotland. Because what I think most people across Scotland want is our two governments to work together. They don't believe that bickering and infighting between the Scottish government and the UK government actually benefits anyone here in Scotland. The only people it benefits uh, is either side who thinks they've got the upper hand 
in whatever individual argument they are holding. So I do think this is more of a, a narrative that the SNP are putting forward to their supporters rather than focusing on what could actually benefit people in Scotland. And I think there's plenty of examples where the two governments can and do work well together. I've always been a fan of city and region growth deals, and that's an example of governments at a UK level and a Scottish level working together to deliver projects and investment in Scotland. So we can see it can be done, it has been done, and I think it should be done more. But then we're not helped in other circumstances where, for example, the SNP Scottish Government withdrew their officials from engaging with the Union Connectivity Review. That Union Connectivity Review brings jobs and investment to Scotland. So people must be puzzled to think, why is their Scottish government not willing to even engage with that? Well, it seems again that they don't want to work with Westminster, they don't want to work with the UK government, and it seems a bit like cutting off your nose to spite your face. Just, just picking up on that point, I've just um, noticed the question from Hugh Rawlings, who's, who's asking specifically about this question. He says, you speak of the Scottish government working more effectively with the UK government. Does this require institutional reform between those two governments to enable better intergovernmental uh, working across the whole of the UK? Um, or, is, or is it simply about reform in each parliament respectively? Well, obviously there is an ongoing review into intergovernmental relations uh, and the Dunlop report will have some recommendations towards that. I know it's been um, delayed a number of times in terms of its publication, but I also just think you know we can achieve a lot by having a government in Scotland that's actually willing to work with the UK government, uh, not one that continues to see uh, its priority as causing division between the two governments. And what we've seen from the SNP Scottish government, not just uh, this year, this month, uh, but for the last 14 years, is a determination at every point to seek division rather than seeking to work together uh, to improve the lives of people in Scotland. So I think actually just changing uh, the makeup of that government here in Scotland as one that will work with the UK government where it's in the best interest of Scotland, but to also challenge uh, where it's appropriate, it would actually deliver major results for people, businesses and communities across the country. Thank you, Douglas. OK, so we've got a question now from um, from Emilio uh, Casaliccio at Politico um, UK. I'm going to come to him um, uh, before others, just because uh, as a kind of journalistic privilege. Um, uh, Emilio asks if the SNP, and this is an if, wins a majority in May, would the best thing for Scotland be for Westminster to a refuse a referendum and allow the debate to be a continual distraction um, that will hold Scotland back for the parliamentary term, or b argue ag agree a referendum so that the contest can be had and the focus move on to what is best for Scotland, either in or out of the UK. Um, I should note that those are probably not the only two options, but um, but those are the two options that Emilio has given. Well, exactly. They're not the only two options, and I'm not going to uh, start predicting the outcome of an election uh, which the campaign has not even started, and indeed the current Scottish Parliament still has three weeks to run. What I would say is Scottish Conservatives are absolutely clear. We don't want another independence referendum. We believe in Scotland maintaining its place as part of the United Kingdom and the benefits Scotland gets from being in that union and the union gets from Scotland being within it. But the risk is not just if the SNP get a majority and they ask Westminster for a Section 30 order to hold another independence referendum. We now know that the SNP are, are planning a referendum this year. They've allocated £600,000 of their party funds to fight that referendum this year. Their Westminster leader and other senior members of the SNP believe it can be held uh, in 2021. And they are looking at options beyond getting the approval of the UK Parliament to hold that referendum, looking to hold a, an illegal wildcat referendum. So that's the, the serious threat to people across Scotland, that the SNP will use a majority if they were to win it in this election to hold another referendum, potentially as early as this year. Uh, and if they don't get what they want from the UK government, they're going to hold a wildcat referendum anyway and bring all the uncertainty with it that that would put in Scotland. And it's simply the completely wrong message as we continue to fight coronavirus and try to protect people's lives. We've got to move to the next stage to protect people's livelihoods, their jobs eh, and communities right across the Scotland are looking for Parliament and our politicians to be focused on recovery, not more divisive referendums. 
Okay, um, so we're now going to move on to some of the um, some of the other kind of more more union focused uh, questions in the in the um, Q and A. And um, I appreciate everyone being so patient, having asked questions uh, kind of earlier on in the session. So Bertie Rushton has been the most patient. He asked, um, "How can those living in England, those proud of our union, effectively help you and the Scottish Conservatives to support and defend it? What's the role for for English unionists within?" this wider campaign and this wider fight to save the union? Uh, well, it's to make sure your, your friends and family who are north of the border know that the Scottish Conservatives are the strongest party uh, across Scotland to challenge the SNP, to take the fight to the SNP uh, at this election. So that's one thing uh, you can do, Bertie. But ultimately, it's about uh, ensuring that the, there is a positive message for Scotland remaining part of the United Kingdom. There's been some uh, opinion polling done uh, recently uh, that shows that people uh, in other parts of the UK are less interested um, in the future of Scotland's place in the United Kingdom. And I think that only plays into the SNP's hands. They like to suggest that England isn't bothered or England wants rid uh, of Scotland from the Union. Now, I know that to be completely wrong, completely false, but it plays to an SNP narrative uh, that they then deploy regularly here in Scotland and in election campaigns. So it's been positive, uh, as I said earlier, uh, about what Scotland provides to the Union and the fact that our family of four nations can come together at times of great crisis, as we've seen during this pandemic, and we can each uh, work um, as uh, individual nations within the United Kingdom, but actually we achieve far more in uh, working together as a family of four nations coming to help out every part of the United Kingdom. And, and kind of linked to that and building perhaps on what you just said, and we've had a question from Darian Murray Griffiths who asks, um, what assurances can you give that any pro-union campaign, um, I suppose whether in the in the, in the upcoming elections or in any potential referendum, but uh, what assurances can you give that any campaign is not just cautionary about the disadvantages um, uh, and the, the kind of prospects of independence, but is also positive, uh, kind of playing into some of the points that you just made perhaps about identity, culture, uh, strength and unity, and how can we avoid project fear? Is, is, is it your view that we need a, a different style of campaign in the coming years than perhaps we had in 2014? Yes, um, I, I don't think we can ignore the many failings, failings of the SNP's plans to, to separate Scotland from the rest of the UK and what that would mean for Scotland. They have to be highlighted because they are failings that were cleared in 2014 and that have not been addressed sufficiently by the SNP ever since. But we have to be positive about what the United Kingdom provides to Scotland and what Scotland gets uh, uh, provides the rest of the UK and there is so much positive that we can focus on. Just look at this pandemic for example. The UK Treasury, the decisions by the UK government have protected 930,000 jobs through the furlough scheme or the self-employed income support. Something like over £3 billion uh, of support through loans to 90,000 businesses uh, in Scotland during that period. And our way out of this awful pandemic is through the vaccine programme, a vaccine programme that has been such a success across the United Kingdom in comparison to our neighbours in Europe and other parts of the world. These are positive benefits of what we can achieve as part of the UK that would not have been available if we were an independent country right now. Thank you. So we've got um, we've got three questions which all touch on the same issue, which is perhaps inevitable, but um, uh, but I'd like to address it anyway, which is um, the uh, the process of leaving the EU and the kind of Brexit process we've been through the last the last three years um, and the implications of that for the Scottish deba debate. Now, clearly, these two issues are interlinked. Um, uh, we know that um, uh, the SNP um, has used um, Brexit as one of the one of the chief reasons for saying that a referendum uh, is is legitimate again, six, just six years after the last one, um, because the circumstances have changed. And we so we have three questions. The first is um, John Kincaid asks, given how long it took for the UK to leave the EU, uh, what would the process be for breaking up the union? What would that look like? Um, uh, what what is the time frame? Um, we have a question from James Terras who asks. Um, uh, we talked about a very interesting debate on constitutional issues, but it is noted that not, not once have you mentioned the effect of Brexit on the Scottish economy and what, what Brexit will mean for, for Scotland, um, referencing some things that the UK government has said about Scotland being, being better, better off. Um, uh, and then we have a final question from, from Debbie McCreeth, who's 
uh, saying that Brexit is potentially something that could be used against us, uh, an argument um, used against voting for the Scottish Conservatives. Do you have any plans to learn from Brexit in the argument against independence? So, so three kind of interlinked questions, which I might just ask you to come back on, Douglas, if that's all right. Uh, thanks, Will. And, and I've spoken about Brexit in a number of the speeches uh, that I've given, and indeed one I gave with Policy Exchange looked at that specifically. So I don't underestimate uh, the concerns people had about uh, voting in 2014 to remain in part of the, as part of the United Kingdom, but also voting to remain in 2016 as part of the European Union. And we know 62% of Scotland voted to remain in the EU, but we should never forget that more than a million people in Scotland voted to leave. And indeed, I think to, to go to the last point first, so much was made by the SNP of a no-deal Brexit and how terrible that would be for Scotland. They had ramped that up so considerably that when it ultimately came to the deal being agreed on Christmas Eve and ratified by Parliament before New Year, they looked hypocritical to then be voting against the deal, effectively for no deal, when they had warned Scotland and Scottish businesses and people in Scotland eh, that the effects of no deal would be so crippling on Scotland, yet it turned out it was the SNP eh, who were voting for that. In terms of what the process would be uh, if we had uh, an independent Scotland then negotiating leaving the United Kingdom, well, it would be you know immensely worse than the difficulties that we're experiencing in leaving the European Union. We would be leaving a country that, that we remain part of, that we um, you know, have been a proud and strong member of for more than three centuries, rather than the European Union for just over four decades. So there are so many challenges that would face Scotland and the rest of the UK if that decision were ever taken. But it was interesting, uh, a report, uh, I think, by the London School of Economics, which highlighted some of the difficulties for the Scottish economy uh, as a result of Brexit. That report was hailed and used at every opportunity by the SNP when the same London School of Economics then said the impact on Scotland with Scottish independence would be far worse than anything experienced by uh, Brexit. Well, that was... Um, you know, uh, criticised by the SNP. It wasn't uh, a good report uh, and they started picking holes in it. So they like research that backs their argument, but not that which does not. Uh, and finally, uh, I think the, the middle question was uh, about benefits uh, of Brexit and what that can mean for Scotland. And, and first of all, obviously, I've, I've touched on the issues with uh, the vaccine rollout, which we can see in Scotland and across the UK, which is not being matched in the EU. But just look at also some of the trade deals uh, that have been negotiated so far and continue to be negotiated. Liz Truss and the Department of International Trade, uh, their figures show that Scotland, out of all nations in the United Kingdom, uh, is the area that could potentially benefit most from some of these ex exciting trade deals that have been negotiated. Uh, and indeed, just last week, we saw although ultimately they, the EU followed us uh, soon after, but because we are an independent country out with the EU, we were able to see a four-month suspension uh, of the damaging tariffs that have been applied to whisky, to textiles and, and many other products here in Scotland and across the UK. Uh, as I say, the EU followed suit, but they were looking for the advice and guidance that the UK um, had shared with the United States to achieve that. So these are just some examples of how we can benefit independently out with the European Union. Okay, so we've had another we've had another question from um, from a journalist, Rachel uh, Weirmouth. She's she's asked um, if there is to be another referendum, um, shouldn't it be a UK wide vote, not just in Scotland, um, given possible wider ramifications for the whole of the UK, and potentially include multiple options um, for different devolution models? Obviously, the 1997 referendum had two questions um, related to tax raising powers as well as devolution. So there is precedent for. Uh, for several questions being asked. And then she's asked a supplementary question related to what would happen if the UK were to fracture and Scotland were to vote independence, which would, which is, do you, do you agree with Theresa May that the country, the UK, would lose its place with international organisations such as NATO if that were to happen? Uh, so on the first point, I reiterate again, as leader of the Scottish Conservatives, I never want us to have to go through another divisive uh, independence referendum that splits families, workplaces and communities. There was so much damage done in the run up to 2014 and we've con continued uh, to see that damage and fracture uh, in our politics and in our society uh, ever since. But I'm uh, very clear that the 2014 referendum was 
uh, agreed by both sides on a um, franchise um, which both the UK government and the Scottish government agreed to. Both sides said at the time they would accept the result and indeed Nicola Sturgeon um, said it was the gold standard of referendums and I think that's what we should be um, looking towards for any future referendum on any subject. Um, I don't think referendums are binary choice are a great way uh, to decide uh, issues um, uh, in terms of that's why we elect MPs, MSPs to decide some crucial issues. But should we ever have to go down another referendum route, we have to look at the gold standard which previously took place in 2014. In terms of if Scotland were to ever leave the United Kingdom, what would it mean for the United Kingdom in terms of standing with international organisations um, such as NATO? It, it would clearly have uh, an impact and an effect. And I, I've said this, indeed I said it in my speech, uh, to the party conference back in September of last year that you can't somehow assume that if you take Scotland out of the United Kingdom everything just continues as normal. You know Scotland and, and what we do and what we contribute to the Union is weave through everything uh, that um, you know the other three nations uh, of the United Kingdom do uh, and that's on an international stage and on a national level as well so it would have significant can impact um, on England, Wales and Northern Ireland uh, as well as Scotland itself. Thank you. Um, so we've got about uh, kind of eight minutes or so left. So I'm going to um, just try and get through the last remaining questions before we close promptly at 11.30. Um, so, so Kenneth Rigg has asked a question um, regarding some of the proposals in your speech. Um, uh, he says, as a Westminster MP, you can actually vote against um, MPs that have been found in court to have broken the law. Couldn't it be seen as you having double standards to call out MSPs and not MPs who have broken the law? Um, so I, I suppose looking at the, the difference between what you're proposing, the recall you're proposing for, for MSPs and, and MPs, are you, are you looking at something exactly the same or do you, th do you think there should essentially be equivalent standards between the UK Parliament and the Scottish Parliament um, or, uh, or are you looking for something different? Well, I think um, this has to be something that is looked at further and uh, I appreciate doing that on a cross-party basis because obviously at a UK level, it's very simple with one MP representing one constituency. Um, in the Scottish Parliament of the 129 MSPs, 73 of those are individual constituency MSPs, but 56 are regional MSPs. So the example I gave is a constituency MSP, a former SNP finance minister, so the recall procedure at Westminster would work very effectively in that case. There would have to be a different scenario and a different set of circumstances if it were a regional member, which is why I think this should be looked at. But at the moment, Holyrood has done nothing about this. They have looked at this issue time and time again. The system has been found to be failing the people because the constituents uh, of the SNP former minister uh, are not represented in Parliament. He's not turning up to vote. His office is shut. What does that mean for the constituents who need help uh, in that area? But it can't be a light for light uh, with the Westminster system because we have a different system of electing our MSPs with the proportional representation uh, in the list system uh, making up that additional 56 MSPs who could also be subject to recall. Okay, and then uh, perhaps our final question, depending if um, we have any more, or certainly final question for the audience, I've got one more that I'd like to ask, um, which is from Ian Anderson, um, who asks, what more should Westminster, and I guess the Westminster government, uh, do to support the union? Um, is there more that you're looking for from uh, the UK government to do uh, to support the union in the coming months? I think we've seen a lot of progress on this and you know I want to see the direct investment of the UK government is a good thing in Scotland. Scotland has two governments and we shouldn't just think that to invest from a UK level into Scotland we just give extra money to the Scottish government and they decide how that is delivered. There are opportunities through the Shared Prosperity Fund and others to see direct investment into Scotland so people can see both of Scotland's governments investing in their local area and I think that's a good thing, it's a healthy thing but for too long there's been this, and I've described this before, a kind of devolve and forget attitude from Westminster and successive UK governments that we just give money through the Barnet formula and other systems to Holyrood and then don't actually look at how that improves people's lives in Scotland and I think we need to focus far more on that direct investment to show the UK government's place in Scotland in the same way as the Scottish government's place there. Thank you um, so uh, so uh, so one more question from the audience so Andrew Dillon asks about um, 
uh, about kind of reg regional depollution and uh, kind of re greater regional autonomy within Scotland. So one of the great characteristics of the last kind of 20 or so years um, since the Scottish Parliament uh, was created, and especially since the SNP um, became uh, the leading party within the Scottish government is actually centralization within Scotland. We've seen Scottish police force, Scottish fire service, um, Scottish local government all lose powers to Holyrood. And, um, I just I wonder what your what your response is to uh, to his question about whether or not regions should have more power and that actually we should try and reverse some of that process and create greater kind of regional and local control within Scotland itself. Yeah, absolutely. I'm very keen to see more powers flowing out of Holyrood to our local councils uh, across the country. I think we've seen from the SNP over the last 14 years a very centralising agenda, one that takes the powers into Edinburgh uh, and keeps them there. Yet we've seen uh, our communities uh, at local areas suffer because they don't get the support financially or with the powers they need to improve people's lives. So again, it's something I announced at our party conference uh, in the autumn of last year, is far more power and far more support going to local councils and I think there is an appetite for that amongst people in Scotland because they have seen for too long this SNP government centralising powers, overriding local decisions which undermine local democracy. Okay, so so um, final question from the audience, which is from Richard Percival from the Daily Express. He asks, um, how best do you think Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, can help your Holyrood election campaign this year? Well, clearly the decisions of the UK government are already having a positive effect in terms of the vaccine rollout in Scotland, in terms of the levelling up funding going directly to communities. These are all um, uh, ambitions and, and priorities for the Prime Minister and his government see levelling up right across uh, the country, and that includes Scotland, and I think that's a, a positive thing to sell to people in Scotland, while reminding them, and, and I, I do this uh, continually, that uh, you know I'm leading the party in Scotland, it's my team, I'm on the ballot uh, to be returned as an MSP, um, along with my uh, colleagues, and it's our manifesto that's focused on rebuilding Scotland from coronavirus, stopping another referendum, and ensuring we get that economic recovery to protect people's jobs. That's the message I'm taking to people in Scotland over the next few months, but clearly the, the decisions by the Prime Minister and his government to go ahead with that vaccine rollout to level up across the United Kingdom are also positive messages we can take. Fantastic. Well, Douglas, thank you so much. That that has been an enormously valuable and illuminating session. And while inevitably, uh, just a few months ahead of uh, of uh, the, the elections in May, or just a few weeks, I should say, of the, the elections in May, um, this has had uh, something of a party political feel. We've clearly spoken a lot about the SNP, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party's plans. We've also got into some really meaty policy issues about the nature of our constitution, the, uh, the ability of Scottish um, MSPs to hold the Scottish Government to account um, and indeed the relationship between the UK Parliament and the Scottish Parliament as well and the wider future of our union. So it's been fantastic to be able to host you this morning. Um, I really appreciate you sparing the time and uh, being prepared to kind of deliver a speech on an onward platform. We are firm unionists and we believe strongly um, uh, in taking action to secure and restore uh, our union for the benefit of all people in the, in the United Kingdom. Um, so, so thank you very much for joining us. Um, thank you to everyone who tuned in as well. Um, it's been fantastic having you. Thank you for your, for your extremely good and probing questions. Um, and the final thing that I will say before we finish uh, at 11.30 is that this is an issue that Onward is doing live research into. We're, we're um, doing research on how people feel about the union and also some of the policy issues that have emerged in recent months and years about the operations of, of the United Kingdom. And um, we plan to put forward proposals to reform the union and, uh, for the better to ensure that it does endure, not just for the next few years, but for, for hundreds of years to come. So um, that research will be coming out in the, in, the, in the coming months, but it just falls to me to say thank you very much to Douglas for joining us. Thank you very much, Douglas. Thank you. Great. Fantastic. We'll see you all very soon. Goodbye.